So when we're looking at adaptive radiation, we're looking at often a time in the history of life when many species diverged due to abundant resources and change, and then there was followed a period that didn't promote change. There was very little pressure to change. And so it's related to something we call divergent evolution because we'll see lots of different morphologies and niche preferences come from only a small handful of ancestors. And we're going to talk more about divergent evolution in a few minutes. But here you see adaptive radiation. A classic example is the Galapagos finches that Darwin saw where one basic beak pattern was adapted to many different food sources and um, habits of acquiring food, including the cool one down here that uses a tool, a sharp in, uh, needle from a cactus to get at grubs that are hiding in trees. So when we talk about macroevolution, and that's the patterns of change in species over life's history on the planet, we have to keep in mind factors that change the rate of speciation, and that helps us explain some of the, you know, what originally seemed like weird trends in the fossil record had very plausible explanations, things like punctuated equilibrium. So just to recap some things that you'll want to keep in mind um, as we move forward in this lesson is that um, species off Speciation often involves disruptive selection that breaks one ancestral population into two reproductively isolated populations. So you have, you know, selection away from an intermediate form and towards the two extremes for one reason or another. That was from our past lessons. And also that populations have variation that allow them to take advantage of a variety of situations. So that heritable variation is a key element in the forming of new species and, you know, patterns that we look at in the fossil record are related to speciation. So for a species to evolve rapidly, a population has to have access to new environments and niches often. If, um, if their environment is not changing, there's very little um, pressure for change. So change to, you know, access to new environments could happen in a number of ways. You could have new resources become available, and sometimes when this happens, you have one population become adapted to one other species that, you know, was a new available resource, and those two species start to evolve together, and so that is co-evolution. And co-evolution has led to some very odd symbiotic relationships but it has given us a lot of, you know, cool things to see as we go out and observe. You know, we found orchids that can only be pollinated by moths that fly at night. You know, nocturnal moths with these very long proboscises that can reach in and, you know, access nectar and pollinate at the same time. So there's some cool co-evolutionary relationships out there. Also... When there is a new landmass to be inhabited, that's often related to the founder effect. You could have a mass extinction event that gets rid of predators, major predators or competitors. This could be like mammals after the dinosaurs. There was a huge amount of adaptive radiation that took place then because there were so many new niches available, new roles to play without the dinosaurs present. You could also evolve a key innovation or acquire a key innovation, and that's a new trait that allows the population to drastically change its role in the environment. So examples of that would be like humans, we have opposable thumbs, we're able to rock upright, we delayed our ma reproductive maturity that allowed for increased um, brain size um, and allowed us to diverge from mammals and other primates um, in reptiles and birds and insects and mammals. Wings have all been a key innovation for those different groups or branches of the tree of life. And so that allowed them to access the sky, a um, huge amount of resources then available to them. So basically any change that allows a population to use its resources differently in new and novel ways can be seen as a key innovation, and that's going to change the rate of evolution as well. 
So when new resources open up, populations begin to undergo divergent evolution or adaptive radiation. And at that point, natural selection is basically tweaking an existing body plan. So while we may look very different externally, our anatomy and our genes might still share similarities. For example, one of the earliest creatures to walk on land is an animal with characteristics of fish and amphibians. That's Tiktaalik that you saw in the transitional fossils part of this screencast. And, you know, we analyzed their forelimb and we turned up a pattern seen in limbs of many, many creatures on the planet. Um, after your shoulder, there's one bone, then two, then wrist bones, and then fingers, bones to distribute weight. And these are homologous structures. And homologous structures are the result of divergent evolution. And modern anatomists are really turning up lots of examples of this, but it's when the same basic blueprint of a structure has been adapted for many purposes. And homologous structures mean that species share an ancestor. Um, often this is happening over a long period of time, but at some point in their long history on Earth, they share a common ancestor. And so one great example of homologous structures is the five-fingered limb that you see here. Conversely, there are times when a new habitat has opened up and many creatures took advantage. Think of the sky. Once pterodactyls went extinct, the sky was open to any population that had variations for flying. So we see this in Many, many creatures like bats, which are a mammal, and birds both have wings, but that doesn't mean they're related. And so wings are an example of analogous structures, structures that are similar because of convergence or coming together based on the pressure from the environment. And so this is convergent evolution. Convergent evolution means that you have different ancestors. Your structures are not related anatomically, but they serve a similar purpose because of a similar need. So old methods of classifying organisms would have put all flying creatures together, but now we understand how drastically the environment can change species. And so, again, species may look similar, but they're going to be very different on the anatomical or especially the gene level. So occupying a similar niche does not make you related, but it might cause you to have analogous structures. So analogous structures and convergent evolution are related, and homologous structures and divergent evolution are related. And so again, example is the wings, and so you can see here all these mini body plans um, to allow them to fly, but if you look at what's highlighted in yellow, and green and orange, you can see the various structural differences holding the shape of these wings together because they were variations on very different body plans from very different groups of organisms. And not really related to analogous or homologous structures, but just sort of related to evolution and evidence in general, are vestigial structures. And those are those weird structures that seem to have no purpose anymore, but they are evidence that they probably are there because they were in an ancestor. And so examples of that include snakes that have like remnants of a pelvic girdle indicating that their ancestors had legs, tailbone in us, our own tailbone, we do not have a tail, tiny hind limbs in whales indicating that they did once come from creatures that walked on land and they have like a uh, remnants of a pelvis and hind limbs. They have some bones that aren't really attached to anything. And wings and ostriches, which are used for balance, but they are not used for flying. 